Yeah, go ahead and record this panel. Yeah, go ahead and record the panel if you'd like. We'll probably need to close that door yeah. at some point or another. Uh, actually, we'll need to close that door in about one minute. So I will, when I go, you, you will do that. See? Fantastic. Uh, this is not a bad crowd. Good size crowd for it. This will be kind of a, this will be an information dense panel that will have me going through a vast number of topics very quickly. Um, so it will be basically drinking from the fire hose of information. <laughs> I just want to make sure everybody is clear on that. Come on in. Yeah, there's seats up in front if you want them. Mm -hmm. Go for it. All right. It is now 11 a.m. and uh, we'll go ahead and start. Can actually everybody hear me? All right. Then I'm going to just go ahead and have the microphone here just in case my voice falters and then switch over. But here's what this panel is. I'm going to be talking about the current state of the publishing industry in a very general sort of way. I'm hitting a lot of points. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about finance for writers. It will mostly be for newer writers, uh, but people who are currently in the writing life might actually find some use of it as well. And if you ask well, John Scalzi, not that you're not a wonderful person who dresses fantastically, <laughs> but what do you actually know about A, publishing, B, finances? In order, I've been writing professionally since 1990. I have been president of the Science Fiction Fantasy Writers of America for three years, between 2010 and 2013, where we very specifically uh, kept an eye on what was going on in publishing and with uh, our members' finances when at all possible. I, my very first book in 2000 was a finance book uh, called The Rough Guide to Money Online. I uh, consulted uh, for a number of years with uh, financial services companies, including Oppenheimer Pincus Funds, and uh, oh boy, what was the other one? Uh, uh, U.S. Trust. Um, I've spent. I, I also wrote a finance newsletter for a number of years. So I've spent a lot of time, both professionally and personally, um, talking about finances and dealing with matters relating to publishing. So I have some experience. It's not just me blathering ignorantly from a from point of view. I still blather, but it's not entirely ignorant. First thing I'm going to do is actually talk about, give a very general state of uh, publishing bit, and I'm going to talk a little bit about traditional publishing, I'm going to talk a little bit about self-publishing, I'm going to also talk a little bit about the new hotness, which is the subscription models and what that means for, for writers. Um, so it's been an exciting time in uh, publishing for the last decade or so because we've had the rise of electronic retailers, we've had the uh, rise of uh, e-readers and electronic books, and that has made for a lot of changes. Some of the changes that, that we have are now, um, e-books are a significant part of the, the landscape. When I started writing in 2005, they were maybe 1% or 2% of the market. Uh, nowadays, I sell, personally, uh, I sell more in electronic than I do in hardcover. It is the primary driver of my business, and a lot of writers will find it to be anywhere from 30 to 70 percent of their business. Um, so it is is vastly important. That said, there are some uh, you know changes for writers. One of the things that's different is that with hardcover books, for example, you get paid a flat amount for every unit sold. So and it's based on a list price. So if a book has a list price of 24.95. Uh, most writers will get 10% of that cost. If it's $6 or $8, you'll get 10% of that cost. Basically, the royalties are around 10%. But it's a fixed cost based on the cover price that is set by the publisher. With electronic, what you get is a percentage of the net. And what the net is, it's like if the book sells for $15 on Amazon, Amazon will take 30% as the retailer fee. Uh, the rest, 70%, will go back to publisher and you will get 25% of that. As a That can be scary because with electronic books what we have found is that uh, there's a lot of fungibility with the price, that the prices will go anywhere from up to $15, $16 all the way down to $9 or $6 for hardcover era release and then even lower than that to $2.99 or sometimes even $0.99 cents 
for a paperback release. And so what that means is the chunk of money that you get gets progressively smaller the lower the price goes, as opposed to uh, print books where you always get the same amount. Now the flip side of that is for a lot of writers, that's fine because they'll sell more electronically anyway and it will sort of all even out. But that is a, that is a substantial change in the landscape and it has an effect for, uh, for writers and authors. Traditional publishers have been challenged recently because of the whole, you know, uh, Amazon and everything else, but they've, and also with electronic books, but things have stabilized, generally speaking, uh, both for print sales and for publishers. Whenever there's a massive disruption in, in the market, which is what happened with Amazon, uh, they just became, uh, in the landscape of, uh, of commerce, almost overnight, the most substantial retailer of books. Um, that, that was a huge difference. Borders, which was one of the two major national chains, uh, filed for bankruptcy a couple of years uh, ago, and that had a huge impact on sales because all of a sudden hundreds of outlets that you would have had to sell physical books disappeared, and that, of course, uh, meant that ebooks were even more important, which meant that Amazon is the primary uh, avenue of retail uh, ebook sales, something like uh, 60 to 70 percent, became even more important. So there was a lot of uh, turmoil and transi uh, transition that was also coupled with the fact that the economy from 2008 until just very recently was also sort of in turmoil. So it made it a very interesting time for writers. The good news is that things have stabilized somewhat. Uh, Barnes & Noble is still kind of plodding along, not as healthy as we would like it to be. But independent booksellers, uh, especially in the last couple of years, have rebounded for two reasons. One, because Borders is gone. Uh, which means that a lot, at least some of the business that was going to Borders is now going to the independent bookstores. Uh, the other thing is that independent bookstores, uh, generally speaking, have gotten smart and have diversified. So they're not only just doing books, but they're also doing games, tabletop games. They're also doing uh, things like having coffee shops and doing more events and book clubs and so on and so forth. This is great for authors. It means that uh, Hopefully, uh, brick and mortar sales are not going away anytime soon. It means a more diversified market, uh, which is generally going to be for the positive. Now, as I said, uh, Amazon has become a major player in this area. It's a major market. Um, and many of you may have remembered uh, in the last year that there was that big battle between Amazon and Hachette, and that it became this big drama where uh, they had indie authors versus traditional authors, and they were all fighting, and so on and so forth. Um, this was largely a smokescreen. The simple fact of the matter is Amazon and Hachette were arguing about how much of a percentage they, uh, the Amazon was going to get for sales, plus how much Hachette would have to pay for something that's called co-op, which is advertising that is uh, put on the site, and various other sorts of things. Uh, the reason that you know it, it blew up the way it did was for the same reason recently Dish Network and Fox News had a fight about carriage. And so the Dish Network uh, said uh, that Fox was you know, being terrible and not you know, wanting to play fair, and Fox News complained about censorship. They want to roil the waters to try to give pressure on either side by what they see as interested parties. But ultimately, it was just a simple negotiation. Um, and the fact that people chose sides uh, indicates a couple of things. One, that people really do believe that publishing is a kind of a football team sort of thing. Which side are you on? Are you on the side of the you know, independents? Yes, all right. Or are you on the side of the traditional publishers who you know have been doing things for so you know? And, and it was stupid, is what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> But these things are going to happen again and again. Uh, it was Hachette's time for this contract to come up. Uh, Simon & Schuster had a contract that came up concurrently that was very quietly handled because that's the way they decided to handle it. Contracts uh, will be renegotiated again and again in a couple of years. Macmillan, who is my publisher, will have this happen and again they will uh, have an effect. This is like what happened again like four years ago when uh, uh, Macmillan told Amazon we want you to do uh, something that's called agency pricing rather than a, a straight percentage and they had that same fight and Amazon pulled titles and so on and so forth. Get used to that. That's going to happen a lot on a day-to-day -day basis as writers. It's not going to affect you unless you are with that particular author in a lar or that particular house. In a larger sense, 
need, you need to be aware that Amazon has a huge amount of sway um, and that they will uh, use that to their advantage because they have a long-term plan to make sure that you buy everything from Amazon forever and ever on men, <laughs> which is neither good nor bad, but just as a simple fact of, of the way that they do things. Um, electronic publishing, like I said, it has been uh, kind of an exciting place to be because it's expanded so much, but it's flattened out recently. And part of that is because um, things like Kindles and Nooks and Kobo readers and stuff, most of the people who want them have them. Um, they don't replace the e-readers, the direct e-readers as much as they used to. Um, you know, they, they don't replace them like they replace phones. You have an e-reader, you keep it until it breaks. You know, I had a, I had a Nook that broke last year on the ship, you know, and I had it for three years, uh, got a new one, and I will replace that one probably five years from now when that breaks, Where, whereas you replace your phones on, on a regular basis. But what that means is because they flattened out in terms of sales, um, the, a lot of the impetus to buy books electronically because now i got to fill up my thing uh, has slowed down. This again is neither here nor there, but what it means is that as a total percentage, people believed, quite frankly, that you know electronic was going to eat print uh, much in the same way that uh, MP3s ate uh, CDs and, and so on and so forth. And over time, like I said, the majority of my sales are electronic. A majority of a, a lot of authors will see them be a substantial part of their sales. But it does appear that uh, print will be around more or less you know, for a, a long time, although there are some challenges to that, and I will get to those in just a minute. Um, one thing that has been coming up in, in the book world, which is really worth your time to pay attention to, is audiobooks. Um, I will give myself as a, as a personal example. Up until literally like three or four years ago, I was like, eh, audiobooks, who cares, right? Um, because I was old people, you know, listening while they <laughs> jogged around in the mall and stuff. Like, no offense to old people, they're wonderful, and I will be one soon. <laughs> but uh, they didn't. It didn't seem to me to be a major part of, of my market. As it turns out, uh, people really like audiobooks, and the audiobook uh, folks have really been aggressively stepping up uh, sales. So, for example, Lock In, which is my most recent book, uh, which came out uh, in August, got on the New York Times bestseller list. Yay me! It was the hardcover. I've sold as many in audio because uh, Audible.com, who is my audiobook publisher, really aggressively pushed it, um, as I have in, in hardcover. They, it is a growing field. There are a lot of people who uh, have found that this is a fantastic growth opportunity. So when you're a writer, one of the things that you have to be paying attention to is the fact that audiobook will be part of your landscape. Uh, I learned that sort of the hard way because one of the things that I do in my books is I do a lot of dialogue tags. He said, she said, he said, she said. When you're reading it, it it's make basically it's just, you know, you block it out. You like you see it but you don't process it. You know it's there. When you listen to it, you're like, Jesus <laughs> so many audio tags. And so now when I write, I try to cut down the number of audio tags or a dialogue tags because I know it's going to be read probably by Will. <laughs> uh, and so uh, that, that makes a difference. But it is an expanding market and there's a lot of opportunity there. But there's also a downside, which is 90% of the American market for audiobooks is owned by Audible.com, which is owned by anyone? Amazon. Amazon. Yeah, it's Amazon. You will live with them forever. <laughs> and this is fine for the people who are the 1% of audio uh, book uh, sellers um, because they'll get treated very well. Uh, it will m make things more difficult for uh, people coming up because Amazon, <coughs> one way or another, will be able to dictate terms, uh, whether to the authors directly or to uh, the publishers with whom the, uh, the Audible.com is working to carry the books. So be aware that that is something that's going to be in your future. Um, we talked very briefly about the bricks and mortars, the chains and indies, like I said. Brick and mortar is stabilized. Independence seem to be trending up. All this stuff is very good for us. Uh, let's hope it continues, but there are challenges, and I'll get back to those. Self-publishing. There has never been a time in the history of the world uh, a better time to self-publish than now. It is <coughs> trivially easy for you to take that story that you did, just put it up on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or Apple, iTunes, or whatever. So that's fantastic. It's also the downside of it is that it is trivially easy for anyone to shove that stuff up there, uh, which means that the market is basically flooded at this point. 
Um, and it is very, very difficult to have things stick out. Things do stick out. Um, you know, Hugh Howey is a perfect example of that. But this, but the thing to remember is that there have always been the outliers. There have always been every year that one guy or that one thing that has been done spectacularly well. Never ever rely on the outlier to be uh, indicative of what the field is. Hugh Howey, great, love him. He's a great guy. Um, he is not the face of self-publishing. The face of self-publishing is the 23-year-old writer who has taken their first book and decided to go into uh, self-publishing rather than to go the traditional route. <clears throat> Without the accoutrement that you now gets or that the top 1% of, of sellers get. It's a very, very competitive market. Um, it's a very competitive market with publishing anyway. Most books, like 90% of books or more, sell less than 1,000 copies. Um, a larger percentage of self-publishing sell fewer than 500. The nice thing about self-publishing is depending on who you're, who you're working with, you can get a larger chunk of the money. If you're dealing with Amazon directly and you work in their Kindle Publishing Select thing, you can get 70% of the income or 35% of the income if you go uh, to many uh, distributors. So it will appear that you're getting more money. The question then becomes, is are you going to get more money by going with them and doing everything yourself? Or would you get more money by going with a traditional publisher and having them do all the work and then getting their royalty? This presuming that you have a choice between the two. But this is a serious choice that people now have to make and they have to be aware that there's an option and, and for a lot of writers there's not necessarily a penalty for going one over the other. Amazon is the 500 pound monkey, uh, sea monkey if you will, uh, of uh, indie publishing. And that is both positive in that, you know, everybody knows what Amazon is. It's easy to find stuff. It's also negative, which means that they have an exceptional amount of control over the market. And that is something that you as writers need to be aware of. When you, when you uh, send a book up the chain to Amazon to be put in the market, one of the things that you do is you sign their terms and conditions. The terms and conditions are different than a contract that you would sign with a publisher. The contract you sign with the publisher can pretty much be mutually negotiated. You will have an agent for this, hopefully, but you will go back and forth and say, I want this term, I want that term, I want this term, I want that term. And you can argue about what you want. When you upload through Amazon, or in fact, not to single out Amazon, pretty much any of the retailers, um, you, are signing, you are signing a basically end user license agreement where it can be unilaterally changed by uh, the other party. They will, if you find something problem, you want to sue them, you will have to go to arbitration. All that fine print you should actually read and maybe have someone who has a uh, uh, law uh, degree and particular interest in contracts to look at it for you if you're serious about that. It's a pain in the ass, but you should know what you're getting into. Um, you should be doing this with your contracts regardless. Any contract you ever sign, oh my god, but with your content, with your book, with the thing you just spent months and months writing, even more so. If you're okay with that, if the fact that you're, it's basically one-sided and it's all at the retailer whim, one way or another, that's fine, but be aware that that is something that you need to do. Amazon's the largest, obviously. Uh, iBooks from Apple, uh, Google Play, uh, Barnes & Noble. Kobo. These are all other venues. There's also Scribed. There's also um, uh, Smashwords, Wattpad. These are all various places where you can upload your work, have it monetized. Some of them will draw slightly different crowds than others. Wattpad is some, what my daughter uses. Uh, it's got a lot of fanfic. It's got a lot of uh, young writers there. She loves it. You know, just post up a story, get feedback. Um, Scribed gets used a lot for uh, uh, I, I tend to see it as male writers and also people who are sending up documents that need to be viewed and so on and so forth. There's, there's, there are differences between them. Sooner or later, if you want to get to a mass market, you are going to have to deal with the major retailers. Um, there is another option that people have uh, these days that they didn't have even just a few years ago, which is kickstarting or doing Indiegogo or all of those sorts of things. And for some people, this is a fantastic opportunity. You may have heard of this fellow named Matthew Inman, <laughs> who has uh, 
has has made just a little bit amount of money on that. Or uh, those nice young fellows, Paul and Storm, <laughs> or that Jonathan Colton film. It's something that works, and it's something that you can do, and it is something that, all, particularly if you have an existing audience, you know, however you've developed them. If you have a large Twitter following, if you have a large, you know, uh, you know, Tumblr or Live Journal follower, or whatever, but you can turn that in. The thing that people need to know and be aware of, and this is with self-publishing generally, but Kickstarter and Indiegogo and stuff like that in particular, is this is work. One of the reasons that I, by and large, stick with traditional publishers, except for very specific things, is I'm good at a couple of things. I'm good at, at writing, I'm good at marketing myself by going on to boats and saying, hi, let me talk to you, <laughs> right? Copy editing, oh, no. Uh, regular editing, no. Page design, no. Cover art, no. These are not things I'm competent at, and I want people who are super competent to be doing those things. Uh, and so it's worth it for me to be with a traditional publisher because they do the things I can't and don't want to do, uh, and they do it for what I consider a fair price. One of the great rhetorical nonsense things that we have are a bunch of people, it's like, I will occasionally get email, people send it to me, can I just send you money directly? I want to cut out all those middlemen. I was like, A, no, B, <laughs> Uh, those middlemen are people who are made the book that you love. The, the, you know, a book is not just what the writer puts into it. A book is a group effort. Um, and these middlemen, which is used as a derogatory term, are actually really valued partners that I love to work with. So please pay them. <laughs> if you don't have these super valued partners that you love to work with, you will have to do literally everything yourself. And if you do a Kickstarter or an Indiegogo, you have to do that extra added bit of fulfillment, of doing all the stretch goals, all of these sorts of stuff. I know <clears throat> a lot of people who have done Indiegogo stuff and then uh, stuff with uh, uh, Kickstarter, and by and large, they're very positive and they're all like, ah, I'm so tired of stuffing things into envelopes, of signing things, all this, everything that you have to do. So again, if you're this person who loves that, if you're a person who really wants to be in control and know everything about the process and just live it, then it's a great avenue and I highly support that that being something you do. If you're not willing to do that, don't do it because there, if you screw up a Kickstarter, that will follow you until the end of your days. But again, it's something that, uh, that you can absolutely do. But again, it's work. I'm going to talk very briefly about uh, the new wrinkle that is coming up in publishing right now, which is called subscription models. How many of you have Spotify or Rhapsody or Google Play or iTunes? You know, well, not iTunes, but a streaming audio sort of thing. Um, this is very similar, that you sign into, Amazon has one, uh, Oyster is another uh, example of a, a company that does that, Scribe uh, does that as well, where you pay a flat fee per month, usually somewhere in the area of about $10, um, and they give you access to tons and tons and tons of books. And so when you read the book, uh, eventually something will be tallied to the author's account, Hopefully they'll make money. In theory, this is a great uh, this is a great idea for readers. It's a, it's a fantastic thing, provided that they have books that you actually want to read. Um, just like Spotify is great for music discovery and doing all that sort of thing. Um, for um, for writers and publishers, uh, it is somewhat more ambiguous at this point <clears throat> because what is being discussed right now is how this works for the writers. How do the writers get paid? And not surprisingly, there's a schism between how traditional writers get paid um, and how indie writers get paid. And let's use Amazon as an example of this. Amazon now has their Amazon Prime uh, uh, service, right? So for $8.99 or whatever, you get a whole bunch of books that you can read. If you are traditionally published, like me or a lot of other authors, uh, what happens is after they've read 10% of the book, uh, you get credited for a sale, I think, at the basic, whatever the price uh, of the book is on Amazon at that particular moment. Um, and the, it, it works on the same principle as a buffet. Um, you pay 10 bucks for the buffet, but you're probably not going to buy, you're not going to consume 10 bucks of food because it's, that's a lot of food. Um, but there will always be a few outliers who are like, I'm here all day, right? <laughs> In the same way, 
the vast majority of subscribers, they presume, are not going to be able to read $10 worth of books. But there will always be a few outliers, probably everybody in this room. <laughs> um, so what they're hoping is that the larger number of people will subsidize the smaller number of people who actually cruise through a, a ton of books. Um, so, but for traditional publishers uh, and the authors with them, they get the, at the moment they'll get paid more or less like they do for traditional for books. With self-published authors, it's an entirely different thing. What they are uh, with Amazon, what they are doing now is they are Amazon creates a monthly pool of money, a million dollars, two million dollars, whatever the month of whatever the pool of money is. They make the decision; it's a unilateral decision how much money is in the pool. Everybody who is a indie author with Amazon and has exclusively put their stuff on Amazon will, if the book is read after a certain amount of time, triggers as a sale and they get credited, but they get credited as a proportion of that pool. Um, and so what that means is that <coughs> unlike traditional publishing folks who have essentially an unlimited pool of income from which to draw because they are getting paid per read, you are getting paid in proportion to what everybody else uh, you're competing with. Um, and you're getting paid only the amount of money that Amazon decides to, to put in. Needless to say, this has not been popular with Amazon's authors because all of a sudden they've seen income drop and they are, in, they are literally in competition. I'm not in competition with other writers. Like, I'm not in competition with Pat. Someone who's going to read Pat's stuff may read my stuff or they won't. But it's very rare that if they want to read me and Pat, we're not coming from the the same pool, we will still get paid. So I want Pat to be successful. But if I was one of these indie uh, uh, Kindle guys, I would want everyone else to die in a fire. <laughs> <laughs> Which is bad news for authors, because it really has literally made it into a zero-sum game. So that is going to be the challenge. The challenge for publishers is obviously Amazon and other subscriber uh, services want to s put things into that pool. Um, so the negotiations that will be going forward are uh, you know, Amazon or any of these other folks will say, you can have 10% of authors, of your authors who get paid the traditional way, but we want everybody else in the pool, right? Or something like that. Um, and so that will be the downward pressure that we need to be thinking about um, as authors. It's going to be, it's going to be the, the future fight. The other thing about this is that this will have an effect on bricks and mortar retailers. Uh, how many of you have gone to a music store recently? Hmm. Right. Uh, and everybody else just gets their stuff online. Um, it's very difficult now to find standalone music stores. The number is, has literally collapsed. There are places that you can still find them, but when I was, you know, when I was a kid, we had licorice pizza, and we had the warehouse, and we had coconuts music, and we had all of those places. Um, and now, literally within a 50-mile radius, there is one music store. It's FYA, FYI, and it's in a dying mall. You know, um, and that is the future that booksellers have to worry about because if subscriber models become popular. Um, that could collapse their market, which for writers also means that their market could collapse as well because then again, you'll be stuck with just the few players instead of the independents and, um, and then the game changes because the leverage that they have will be substantial. What this all means is that it's a very exciting time to be a writer today. <laughs> but the thing I also want to impress on you is that it's always an exciting time to be a writer in the world. 30 years ago, Science fiction and fantasy books, which is what I do, were sold in supermarket racks. They were all little tiny books. That collapsed because the 700 distributors of uh, rack jobbers, that's what they call them, distributors of books, uh, basically Kroger's or one of the major said, uh, uh, chains of grocery stores said, we don't want to have to deal with 700 people anymore. We want to deal with two. Fight it out. It's Hunger Games time. <laughs> and at the end of it, you had two distributors of magazines and books. And so science fiction just fell under the hole, you know, because romance was the, a, a big draw for supermarkets. Because who does shopping, right? Yeah. yeah. I, sorry to be sexist, but that is actually, you know, romance is the largest segment of the, uh, of the industry. Uh, and they are super loyal. If you were a supermarket person and you weren't, like doing at least 80% of your rack's uh, romance, you would be leaving money on the table. And that still continues. So we have mostly romance, we have mostly 
uh, a few of the you know uh, action adventure thrillers stuff like that you may see one or two science fiction things but the good news was at the same time bookstore chains were on the rise and that's why bookstore you know and that's why science fiction moved out of pulps into hardcovers and so on and so forth and every era has this um, you know, some market models go up, some market models go down, some writers thrive in the new market models, some don't. Uh, and some just keep plugging away. Stephen King never <laughs> stops selling. You know? And this is not a bad thing. Uh, but, this, you know, quite honestly, um, there will have always been challenges, there will always be challenges, there will always be the 1% of people who make 90% of the money, there's everybody else who fights on the scraps. Um, it's not inevitable, there are opportunities now for people who haven't been able to get their stuff out that uh, have never existed before, um, and there are ways to leverage it. But by and large, what you're seeing now is in some ways old news. We really, literally have always been in a crisis in publishing. This is the one now. So that is where we are with publishing, and we're at exactly at 12.30, so that's great. And um, so now I'm going to actually go flip things. So you are a writer, and you want to publish, and you want to uh, be financially successful at this. Um, and I think that's wonderful, and I think it's possible. And I think that uh, a lot of what uh, concerns me about writers, who I love, I mean, they're my people, uh, but most of them are just complete shit with their finances, and it terrifies me. <laughs> Um, and so one of the things that I would do when I was at Viable Paradise, I keep pointing to him because he was one of my students there, uh, would, would be, a, I would give a tough love thing about your money, right? And I'm going to give you an abbreviated version of that so that we can ask questions at the end, uh, and then we all have to scoot out of here because Steve Jackson is going to have office hours. Um, but So here's the first thing. So it's a challenging time to be a writer. It's always been a challenging time for a writer. You are going to be a writer. If that is what you're going to do, and that's the only thing you are going to do, prepare to be broke. Okay? The vast majority of writers make less than like two or three thousand dollars a year from their writing. Um, part of that is, you know, it's just the, the, the fact of the market. Part of it is that. Uh, Advances are typically not very high in science fiction and fantasy, which is the world that I work in. The average starting advance is $6,500, which is what I made for Old Man's War. That was my advance for Old Man's War. Uh, if you're two or three or four or five books in, you get all the way up to $12,000 if you're writing science fiction and maybe $15,000 if you're writing fantasy. And that is, it'll take you about a year, and sometimes it takes people two years to write an entire book. And you don't get all that money at once. You get a little bit up at first, then you get a little bit, uh, you know, when you turn in your manuscript, then you get a little bit when it gets published. So it's spread out, right? Or if you go the indie route, you can get it immediately, but you get no money up front, um, and that's kind of the risk there. There are more uh, traditional publishers are trying to get uh, you to agree not to take an advance at all in exchange for higher back end royalties. Uh, and that's really up to you, but just remember the vast majority of books don't earn out, and what that means is that often uh, you will get more as an advance than you would get even if you just went by sales alone. This is an equation you have to be thinking about. But regardless, unless you are in that 1% of writers, um, what you're going to make off of, the, uh, off of your book or off of your short stories, which pay these days terribly, um, or uh, off of uh, entertainment articles or so on and so forth, generally speaking, is going to be low. Um, that's just the landscape. The good news is it has always been the landscape. It's not just this era. Once again, it's been all times. Writers have always starved. Aren't you lucky? <laughs> but that is something that you need to put into your thinking. When I got my first two-book contract, my family was like, not my wife, who knows, but like other family members like, so you're rich now. And I just laughed and I laughed and I laughed. No, I said, I'll be sleeping in your garage when I'm 60. <laughs> so prepare to be broke. Have that as part of your landscape that you're not going to make a lot of money from writing. Um, and you know what? They, ne they never, since they never have been, this has been a, an applicable thing. Don't quit your day job. If you have a day job, 
and you have a day job that pays you reasonably well, and it gives you benefits, and it gives you a 401k, and a stable base of income so you know exactly what you have coming out, uh, coming in and going out every month. Why would you mess with that? <laughs> Let me ask you, why would you mess with that? And you're like, well, I want to write full time. I am a full time writer. The vast majority of my time is not spent writing. You know, even when I'm in a like, oh wow, this is awesome, I'm on a roll, I typically only spend a couple hours a day writing. And then my brain goes, I can no create more food, right? <laughs> and then I'm done. And then I answer email and do all those sorts of things that are uh, not, you know, particularly creative. But the simple fact of the matter is that even for uh, people who are constantly uh, writing, um, it's not a full-time profession. Um, or not a full-time, it is a full-time profession, but what you think of as writing is only a small segment of the day. <clears throat> if you're not making a whole lot of money with it yet, why not keep the day job? Because it is not just about having the money, it is all about the security. For reasons that surpass understanding, the United States has decided um, that uh, safety nets are for losers, and uh, you know, and so it makes it you know you have to have a job one way or the other. Now this isn't a bad thing. Again, ninety percent of people who are writers do other things, in particular they're creative writers like writing fiction. Do other things. Some are professors. Some are teachers. Some of them do jobs that are completely unrelated to whatever writing that they do. Um, nearly every writer you meet has some other job. When I started writing novels, my other job was writing, but it was writing corporate stuff. It was doing newsletters. It was writing nonfiction books. It was doing all the other things that I had to do to support my fiction habit, right? <laughs> um, do that. It's a good thing. And then the question becomes, well, when should I give up my day job? Um, my answer is never, you know, uh, if you could avoid it. Uh, and I always point to Wallace Stevens, the patron saint of day jobs. He was a uh, vice president of an insurance company and also a poet. <laughs> One day he won a Pulitzer Prize and everybody at his uh, insurance company said, what? Because <laughs> <laughs> they literally didn't know that Wally, <laughs> Vice President Wally, uh, was in fact one of the greatest poets of the 20th century. God bless Wallace Stevens. So keep that in mind. Um, if you are going to quit your day job, this is the, the rubric that I give, um, which you can take or leave. If you are making 30% more than what you are making on your day job from your writing, that might be an okay time to, to do it. Because what happens is when you leave that day job, unless you have a supportive spouse, wait for it, we'll get back to this again, um, you are on the hook for your health insurance, you're on the hook for your retirement plan, and you really should be planning that. Uh, you are on the hook for your employment taxes, half of which your employer currently deals with, you have to deal with them now. And you will have to file your stuff quarterly because, strangely enough, the IRS does not trust writers or other creative people to keep track of their money. <laughs> you will have to do all this stuff. You will have to do all this work. So the amount of money that you that you net on a day-to-day -day basis will drop drastically. So if you have 30% more, it will just drop down to maybe 80% of what you had before. So factor that into uh, factor that into your thinking. That said, one of the things that I really do suggest, and I get a lot of flack for this, but I really think it's important, is that if you can, if it fits your lifestyle choices, uh, marry or otherwise shack up with someone sensible with money who otherwise has a real job. <laughs> <laughs> this is, and you laugh, but I'm not joking. I mean, I would not, I would literally, literally not have the career I have if I didn't have my wife. And for, for two reasons. I mean, aside from the emotional support of being married and being happily married, um, there's the fact that she's fantastically good with money. When we first met uh, and she moved into my house, she said, I noticed that you have all these bills on third notice. <laughs> <laughs> you have money. You have a job. What's the problem? I'm like, I know I have to go, you know, do that, but then that means I would have to buy stamps. <laughs> <laughs> and she says... You can just go to the post office and buy stamps. I'm like, I know, but it's just, it's such a pain. She says, you work next to the post office. <laughs> Which at the time was absolutely true. I started to rationalize why this was still not a feasible thing in my life. And she said, give me those. I'm going to pay for that. I'm going to pay the bills from now on. You would not believe our credit score. We could 
buy this boat, <laughs> <laughs> and it's because of and it's because of my wife, uh, but also because she does have the stable income. I have been extraordinarily fortunate in my writing, so we don't have to live within my wife's means. But her stable income means that's what we budget with. She has the health insurance, which means that you know that's one less thing that we worry about. All of these things makes sense. Now, obviously, you can't always say, I'm a writer and I require a sensible spouse <laughs> who wishes to sign up for this fantastic journey of life. <laughs> um, and sometimes you marry, I, I know writers who write, who marry other writers because who else are they going to meet, right? <laughs> and, uh, and they're both completely insensible about money, but they're in love. So, you know, sometimes you can't choose. But if you can choose, or if you have a spouse or, you know, significant other who is good, has those complementary skills for what you do, um, then A, cleave tightly to them and never let them go, <laughs> send them flowers, give them foot rubs, and let them know that you always appreciate them. Two, make sure that you are reciprocating uh, in that whole quid pro quo thing of relationships so that they are happy as well. But honestly, it's so much easier to be a writer when there are two of you on the journey one way or the other. So, um, moving along a little more quickly because we have just a few more minutes, blah, 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 blah. Um, going back to the thing of remember when I told you you need to make 30% of what you were making now in order to go full-time? If you are going full-time writing, your income is actually half of what you think it is. When you get a check, you know, let's say you get a check for $500, right? Immediately chop that in half. 250 goes into savings. Why? Because taxes because uh, you know expenses, because someday your car is going to break down and you will need money to fix that sort of thing. Immediately just take half of what you're doing, put it aside. That is dealing with taxes and the like. Everything else, which also includes your bills and stuff like that, comes out of that other half. So your, your, your electricity bill, your utility bills, uh, rent if you have it, your mortgage if you have that, comes out of that other side. And this seems excessive, and it is excessive, and I will tell you why. Because life has, on a year-to-year -year basis, in my experience, at least a 10% fuck you surcharge. <laughs> <laughs> a 10% fuck you surcharge is the car breaking down. It is your friends going, you know, the Kansas City mob is going to break my kneecaps if I can't borrow $2,000, help me please. It is your mother, you know, breaking her leg and needing somebody... Uh, to be there full time uh, to care for them, and either you or some, you know, either you need to do it, which takes you away from making money, or you have to hire somebody to do it, which, you know, same sort of thing. That will always be there. Take half of your income, put it away. And the other thing that's great about this is that if these that 10% surcharge never happens, then you've saved money, which you should be doing anyway, <laughs> you know. Uh, it's it, it amazes me. People are like I have to spend everything because I, you know, like a dog who is like, oh, a bowl full of food. I must eat it all now, otherwise other people will take it. No, you can save money. You really do that. All right, uh, moving along. Um, credit cards. How many of you have them? It's okay to have credit cards. You know, sometimes you need them. Generally speaking, use them like cash. Pay them off at the end of the month. The credit card will hate you for it. Um, but uh, the thing about debt is it creeps and crawls on you. And credit card debt is amazing that way. Um, it is the highest interest rate debt that you will ever have. I mean, if you pay the bare minimum off a credit card for like $5,000, it will literally take you the rest of your life to pay off that $5,000. That's what they want. They want a stable base of income and they want you to be that stable base of income. Don't be that. Sometimes I use I use an American Express and I use an American Express because it's a charge card which means that it has to be paid off at the end of the month. But it also keeps track of all of my business expenses and I get an end of the year report and I hand it to my accountant and I say, your problem. <laughs> um, and so it's useful to have them and sometimes you just get in the scrape and you need to put a big thing down. If you haven't been saving your money for that fuck you surcharge. So, <laughs> Have them, but use them as but use them as as cash. And and quite frankly, if you have debt, if you have debt, <coughs> rather than saving, consider paying down the debt, particularly credit card debt, because again, that is the largest 
uh, APR, that is the largest interest you will ever have. Even if you were investing in the stock market, it is almost impossible that the stock market on a year-to-year -year basis will return as much as paying your debt down will. So clear out as much debt as you, as you possibly can. Uh, people, you will get some argument with people about whether uh, mortgage debt is good debt or bad debt, whatever. But definitely credit cards, definitely school loans, all that sort of stuff. Pay that shit down as quickly as possible. Related to this, that's a nice computer. But let's say it breaks down. Um, what? <laughs> Save. Save. <laughs> um, pay cash for what you want to buy um, or don't buy. And I, and I will tell you two reasons for that. One, credit cards. Credit cards are evil. And if you just let it pile up, they will. We've already been that before. Um, the other thing is that the saving up for the thing that you want makes you think about the thing you want and whether or not it's what you really want. Um, you know, quite honestly, if you're like, I want that big screen TV, that's great. Save a little every month to pay for it, and once you get there, you might be going like, well, shit, I've got $1,800 that I was going to buy for this, use for this TV, but might actually need to use it for something else. Is it this TV really worth it, or is the $1,400 TV or the $800 TV sufficient for my needs? The other thing is, is that as you're saving up, the prices on, on almost everything drop. So you will get that discount there. The whole point of it is to get into the idea that you do not spend anything you do not have. Because as a writer, your income goes all over the place and it's all you know up and down, up and down, and then it's all usually within a very narrow band. If you get used to spending more than you have, you are going to be screwed and you will have to go back to the day job that apparently you despise, even though I told you it was awesome for you. <laughs> um, and then when you buy something, as much as you can, buy the best that you can afford, run it into the ground. When I was 21 and I got my first job, I bought a 1989 Ford Escort, and I drove that thing until 2003. I <laughs> ran it into the ground, and we bought our minivan with the license plate not cool, because if you're going to get a minivan, you might as well admit it to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> We've had that since 2003. And we're gonna run that into the ground. And there's people are like, well, you know, you can you can afford a new minivan, and I can afford a new minivan, but I'm gonna run that into the ground because I bought as well as I can. We bought a Honda. That thing will outlive me. <laughs> <laughs> and we're just, you know, because that's the thing. Buy as well as you can. Buy it the quality that you can. Use it until it doesn't work anymore, and you will save money that way. That means sometimes paying more for something up front. For getting the you know the best quality, but you know the simple fact is is you can buy something uh, that you know you can buy a twenty dollar pair of shoes and buy eight of them, or you can buy a two hundred dollar pair of shoes and have it last for eight years. You make the choice. I have a pair of Nike boots that I can't even remember when I bought them. <laughs> you know, quite frankly, they're just they're my in in, in my. Uh, 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 what do you call that thing? Closet. And I'm just like, <laughs> when did you come? Like, I've always been here. I've always been here, boots. <laughs> so, um, and then uh, last couple of things. Uh, try not to live in a super expensive place if you can avoid it. I mean, people love the idea of living in LA or San Francisco or New York. Um, but if you're going to be a writer, you can really literally work anywhere. Um, I have, I will do a financial disclosure for you. I have a five-bedroom house. It's got like 3,000 square feet on a five-acre plot of land. It's fucking amazing. And I pay $1,500 a month in mortgage, right? Which my friends in LA have already tried to stab me. You know, <laughs> that describes their one-bedroom apartment. And the people, poor people in New York, that gets them like a Dunkin' Donuts dozen donut box, <laughs> right? Um, but the fact is, is that where I live, it's very cheap to live, and uh, I have the freedom to do things. I do a lot of TV stuff now, and my agent is always like, you need to move out. It'll be great. And I'm like, I could literally fly out every <laughs> week, put myself up in a hotel, and fly back home on the weekends, and it would still be cheaper than living in fucking L.A. <laughs> so he's not, he's not, you know, uh, convinced me. Now, there are advantages to living in New York, or LA or San Francisco, if you can, um, you know there is a lot of community, particularly with writers and so on and so forth. And obviously, if you don't have a choice, you don't have a choice. But if you do have a choice, consider living somewhere cheaper. It will make a huge difference in your quality of life. Um, and I'm frozen up here. And uh, finally, all of this should give you the idea that writing is a business. 
it is something that is not just about the creative part. It is about uh, selling. It is about maintaining. It is about uh, how it affects your life. Treat it like a business. No one will look out for your interests more than you will. If you are not looking out for your interests, uh, then you're screwed. Nobody, uh, anybody that you enter into a business relationship with, they're not evil, but they will always materially try to make it to their benefit more than yours because that's business. That's the way you do things. If you're not paying attention, you will always be benefiting someone else more than you, whether it's Amazon, whether it's Tor Books, or my people, whether it is anybody that you're doing business with, they will always try to uh, make it as good to them as they can. You are responsible. You need to treat it like a business. The problem with creative people, the problem with creative people is creative people are like, I don't want to think about the business, I just want to think about art. Um, that's fine if you want to start. <laughs> and if you want to start, that's great, it's very romantic. But uh, the simple fact of the matter is you are in the stream of commerce if you are writing. And you need to act like, like you are. And you need to treat it seriously. If, uh, and if you do, then you have a chance to make it. If you don't, then have a supportive spouse. <laughs> and that's the, all the, that's me. We've got about ten minutes to ask questions. Uh, we'll do them as quickly as we can. Please, in the form of a question, I have no comments. Yes. How do you find an editor, and how do you know that they're a good editor? Uh, a lot of the editors that you will find is when you submit your book to publishers in the first place, and you will be assigned an editor, or the editor uh, will come to you and say. I read the book that you submitted, I love it, let me edit it for you. So if you're going through the normal submission pr process with traditional editors, um, then in fact a lot of that will be taken care of, will be take, taken care of for you. If you're doing this freelance or you know, self-publishing, um, then there are any number of ways, I mean people go on Craigslist, people go, uh, there are editors who advertise online. Uh, the way that you should handle that is assume that anybody who you see online, no offense to them, are completely incompetent and you look for the references and you look for the books that they have edited. Um, that will be, again, your due diligence. Um, so as, as far as it goes. But if you're doing it traditionally, a lot of it will be taken care of for you. Uh, for you. If you're doing it uh, independently, again, it's work. So good luck with the work. Yes? Is it more supportive to uh, traditional and indie writers to buy a hard copy of a book than the ebook? Uh, She's asking which format is more supportive of the artist. Uh, typically speaking, by and large, it honestly doesn't matter. Um, you know, when the hardcover comes out, um, I get you know twenty five percent of net on uh, on this side, or you know ten percent of the list price on this side. They are designed to be in sync, so that I pretty much get the same no matter what, right? So it really doesn't matter. It really what benefits you if you want to give that writer an ego boost, um, then what you should do is that you should buy it in hardcover and you should buy it the first week it comes out because then it will count towards the New York Times right. bestseller list. And when you get onto the New York Times bestseller list, your editor calls you up and says, congratulations, you have a new first name. It is New York Times bestseller, <laughs> <laughs> John Scalzi. Um, so that, but in terms of, uh, in terms of the money, Typically speaking, it, it doesn't matter. The other thing is, is like if you're trying a writer for the first time, and you buy the book on, on two ninety nine sale or ninety nine cent sale, fine, you know. Uh, but that said, if you like a writer and you want to support the writer, buy their books, you know, uh, and buy them for you know what you would think is a reasonably fair price for you. You know, don't always wait for the ninety nine cent sales. Go ahead and occasionally buy when the book comes out. That way, no one can spoil it for you. And again, this is going to be a thing that we, we worry about if, you know, as electronic books become larger and the prices go up and down to meet demand. And that's perfectly fine. And that's kind of the way it, it should be. But uh, one of the things that writers will have to do is start arguing in their contract for the, when the prices go down, their royalty rates go up so they are not penalized for Amazon just sort of capriciously deciding in their algorithms that this book or that book needs to go down in 99 cents. Next question. Yes. Uh, in light of your moving deadline, I was wondering, um, for publishers, what kind of incentives and, and, for lack of a better term, punishments they use to keep writers on their schedules, and does that change as you get more successful? Writer, well, how do publishers keep writers on their schedules? Um, the simple fact is, uh, here's, the, here's the incentive. Uh, if you get a reputation for being unreliable, you won't get published. 
That's an incentive. <laughs> um, and honestly, the incentive is, uh, the way the contracts are generally specified is, I get X amount of money uh, for the book as an advance. I get one half X uh, at signing, I get one quarter X at delivery and acceptance, which means that I turn in the book and they say, okay, this works. But if they have edit notes in there, I have to make those edits before they say, okay, we accept this. And then I get one quarter at publication. So if you want to eat and the only income you have coming in through is advances, you want to finish the book. So it's it's financial thing. It's characteristic. So that's how that works. Uh, other questions? We'll take like three more. Yeah? What's the best way to find a trustworthy agent? And is it important that they are in your local area? No. My agent is in New York and I live in Ohio and uh, I rarely see I I had him as an agent for a number of years before I actually physically met him. We talked on the phone all the time, but uh, the thing that I would do, uh, quite honestly, um, don't just, one, if someone comes to you and is like, I'd like to be your agent, <laughs> be a little suspicious, do the work. Almost all reputable agents at this point in human history have websites, go visit their websites, see who their client lists are, check out the client, if the client's list that they have are all in Publish America, which is a vanity house, that will tell you something if they are being published by traditional publishers, which at this point also includes Amazon, they are, like they have a number of imprints as well, um, then that is something else. Again, the due diligence. The other thing is, you know, uh, there's a Publishers Marketplace, which has listings for agents. Um, or, you know, the simple thing is that you could come up to someone you know who's a writer, like me, and say, hey, uh, you have an agent, right? What is your agent's name, and how would I like contact them? And I would say, why well, my agent's name is Ethan Ellenberg. He is at ethanellenberg.com. Take a look and look at his submission guidelines. Follow them to the letter because they are an IQ test, and if you don't, uh, he will recognize that you are difficult to work with already. And submit. It does me no harm to make sure that my uh, agent isn't. Uh, it has a full and happy, stable house. So why not? Uh, and if he won't do it, then maybe the associate agent there, Evan Gregory, who's also fantastic, will. So on and so forth. It's not that difficult to do, but again, you are on the hook to do your due, due diligence. Uh, any other questions? Yes? Um, when you're uh, utilizing an agent, do you usually, I assume you use, after you've the publication discovered, yes, they want to publish your book, or do you want them before you? Well, it uh, works either way. Some yeah. people submit their books to agents first. Mm -hmm. Some people wait until the book gets, uh, gets a... Uh, offer. Uh, with Old Man's War, I got uh, my agent after I got the offer. because uh, And they actually like it when you do that because you're coming to say, I have this big basket of money. Would you like 15% of it? <laughs> <laughs> Why, yes. <laughs> Easy 15%. But um, typically it's worth it because, again, your agent knows the contract. I really am a big fan of agents, and I will tell you why. Everybody here in this room is smart. And that is your downfall because you think just because you're smart that you actually know what's going on in that contract. You have absolutely no idea. There are terms of art in that contract. You do not know. What are reserves against returns? What is basket accounting? You know, what is, uh, you know, arbitration? Oh, my God. You know, Amazon wants you to sign a non-disclosure so you can tell no one how much money you make. You know, so on and so forth. Um, and... Because you think you're smart, it's like, oh, you know, that it would be like that the scene in Wayne's World. Uh-huh, uh-huh, oh, I like what you've done here. You would have <laughs> no idea, whereas your agent does this shit all the time. That is their job. Hire people who actually know how to do the job. Get an agent. Uh, last question. Uh, quick. Are writers' conventions worth checking out, or would you recommend spending more time as a new writer elsewhere? Uh, writer conventions, it really depends on your personality. Are you someone who wants to meet other writers? Do you want to chat with them? Or you want to hang out in the bar and tell you know, writer's stories and stuff like that? Um, if that's not, or do you want to go to panels and, and uh, listen to a bunch of people blather on a, you know, up here? Uh, if that's the thing you want to do, then yes, they're fantastic. If you're like, Jesus, those people would drive me insane. I'd go in with a flamethrower and cleanse <laughs> that town, then possibly you should stay home. <laughs> But there's no harm in going and seeing whether or not it works for you. You know, uh, I don't. I would be wary uh, of the ones that will say, "Spend five hundred dollars, you know, and we will teach you how to write." Um, you can do that a lot. Like all the time, they'll have like a dozen writing panels, and it'll be like fifty bucks for it. But uh, quite honestly, 
honestly, I could I